Let me say something um, by way of background. Um, uh, I was trained as an architect planner, and to some extent, we're all prisoners of the of the time in which we're trained, basically, in that particular context. So I, I still look at the world to some extent um, <clears throat> as an architect planner, perhaps a geographer at times in that sense uh, over the years. But what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to begin by talking about ideal cities and then move towards real cities um, uh, using various methods, spatial methods and so on, which reflect what were called in the 1960s design methods, are still called that, um, opinion pooling, uh, consensus getting and so on, uh, and ultimately uh, machine learning, because there are various um, uh, interpretations of what I've got to say uh, based on linear models. And of course, as we know, linear models uh, represent the essence to some extent <coughs> of the um, contemporary thinking about uh, machine learning. Um, if you want to actually look at the uh, PDF of this, then if you click on one of those links, um, I'll show them again at the end, but uh, if you want to take a photograph, sure, I can I can state them at the end. The tiny URL.com <coughs> is 2p9hbt for R. Uh, they're always a little bit long to uh, remember, I think, basically, but... Um, it's been on on the screen for a bit, so you can have a look at that if you want to, and I'll 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 mention it again at the end. Uh, okay, so let me let me say what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to begin by talking about the real and the ideal city, uh, and I'll talk about um, traditions very briefly in terms of designing the ideal city, uh, and really uh, introduce um, two paradigms: a sort of top-down paradigm and a bottom-up paradigm to some extent that'll reflect what I've got to say. I'll talk about the um, uh, design methods and, and what these are, basically. And then I'll talk about interactions in design. We refer to um, the development of uh, ideal cities and future cities as design in this particular context. Um, the design methods in question really, um, in essence, define the problem as one of features or factors, or indeed actors for that matter, stakeholders, which are linked in some kind of network. And so to some extent, the structure of the network, linking the elements of the design problem together or the elements of the, uh, of the network of designers together, if you like, in that sense, uh, these can be uh, analyzed using a whole variety of different network methods, in particular hierarchies and as we'll see design trees. I'll then move to the second interpretation, which is really opinion pooling. We can move from the the idea of a network of related factors or features uh, to the idea of uh, resolving or uh, using the network to actually resolve conflicts between the, the features and factors. And I'll introduce the idea of Markovian design machines. Um, I'll then look at a couple of examples, locating new towns and highway design. Uh, and then in the last uh, five minutes or so, I'll talk about explaining the real city as opposed to the ideal city, because a good deal of what I'm uh, talking about is from the point of view of the, the ideal city, basically. But there are parallels, as it were, uh, with the real city in some sense, and we can begin to generalize some of these network design methods to neural nets and deep learning in that sense. So that's really a speculation. Uh, and then I'll make a couple of points about where we go from here, which are the limits to AI. I'm using AI in the in the most generic sense as really, to some extent, contemporary computing, I suppose, in that sense. OK, the real and the ideal city. Well, we can make the distinction between the real city. And most people, I think, at this meeting probably think of cities in terms of real cities. You have to be trained to some extent uh, as a designer, really, from the top down. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of this in a moment to actually sort of think about the ideal city in this sense. But the real city and the ideal city are contrasted in many senses. And we'll be doing this. Uh, in this particular talk. So let me begin by showing you a couple of examples of the ideal city. Um, ideal cities are in, in, invariably defined, they defined either from the top down or the bottom up, but two examples of the first top down paradigm are as follows. The, the first example is, um, uh, is the plan for Paris in 1924. Uh, this was by Le Corbusier. There's a picture of Le Corbusier there on the, uh, on the left, basically. Of course, he was known for uh, the modern movement and modernism in that sense. And you can see to some extent how outrageous that ideal plan is. This is central Paris in 1924. Um, 
it, it, it's assumed, in fact, that we've moved a little bit beyond this, but I'm not actually sure we have moved that far beyond this because the, the current um, proposal for the NEOM, which is the linear city in Saudi Arabia, uh, is equally outrageous in its contradistinction in its distinction against what real cities really look like in that sense. So Corbusier had an important uh, um, uh, influence in terms of these sorts of ideal cities, very much the architectural focus in some sense, but there were questions of density, space and so on uh, contained in his uh, uh, arrangement of geometric blocks in this sense, uh, in terms of his city, his, his city of tomorrow or uh, the Radiers, as it was called. Um, uh, another contrast uh, is roughly um, 20 or 30 years before, Ebenezer Howard, who was the uh, inventor, if you like, of the Garden City idea. I'm not sure that he was the original formulator of that notion. The Garden City was quite widely used, I think, uh, in the late 19th century in Britain, really, as a contrast to the, the, industrial, uh, the industrialization of cities in that sense. And this was his plan for the, uh, for the ideal city in the sense it was the taking, if you like, of development out of the industrial city and placing it in the countryside. And you can so almost see a rendition of this uh, in terms of modern British planning. You can almost see, if you look with a bird's eye view at London, you can see the, <clears throat> the 10 new towns that were built immediately following the, uh, following the Second World War, a little before actually, um, uh, Wellin and Letchworth Garden cities basically were prior to the Second World War. Uh, but most of the new towns, Stevenage, Harlow and so on, um, <clears throat> Basildon were built after the after it, and you can sort of see if you look at the plans back then. Of course, Patrick Abercrombie was the great planner who um, uh, was associated with implementing, if you like, the Ebenezer Howard vision. So these are ideal cities. No would no one would pretend these necessarily map very easily uh, onto the way real cities um, develop. You know, from the bottom up in uh, or evolve in that sense in an organic way. Um, here's another example which shows that to some extent. Uh, the extremes were thought about by various people. This is Frank Lloyd Wright, um, and the big picture there is Broadacre City, which indeed is a, a classic uh, urban sprawl. To some extent, it could be called urban sprawl. Don't think Wright thought of it as urban sprawl. And then uh, and that was 1924, again, about the time of uh, Le Corbusier too. Uh, and on the immediate left is another extreme design by Frank Lloyd Wright, which is the uh, the Mile High City called the Illinois, basically, um, which uh, some say that the Burj Khalifa or the Burj du Dubai with the big, uh, tall building that's nearly a kilometre high in, in Dubai um, is modelled after the after the Frank Lloyd Wright. So you can see here uh, the idea of, uh, uh, of ideal cities in this particular context. Now, to some extent, the, the bottom-up paradigm um, uh, was also developed to some extent in terms of ideal cities. And um, uh, a good example is the, is the sort of uh, notion of uh, where one might build a new town in some sense. So Lewis Keeble wrote a well-known textbook about uh, 70 years ago, which I used as a student, basically, Principles and Practice of Town and Country Planning. Uh, the picture itself shows the, ide the idealism that's contained in this particular context. Um, uh, and if you open that book, you'll find that there's a whole variety of methods, and we'll be dwelling on these, a whole variety of methods that really relate to uh, constraining development, etc., putting development in the most favourable places. So the ideal city in this sense, uh, or the ideal plan, I suppose, in some sense, is to put development in the areas that have the least conflicts in terms of that development, or the greatest attraction, on the other hand. Uh, and this map simply so it shows a small town. I can't I can't read it, it's it's a uh, fine scale basically, but it shows the different factors uh, of, of the, or features, if you like, of, of, the, of the whole context uh, of how, for example, uh, this might influence the future development of the town. Uh, the different uh, blobs basically show areas which, well, it doesn't really matter. They show either areas where you can't develop or areas where you can develop, but you get you get the idea in this sense. Um, this kind of overlay analysis where we identify uh, different layers, if you like, of the uh, surfaces of desirability or utility in some sense, you could think, surfaces of suitability in that sense, these sorts of overlay methods were quite widely used um, in, 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 in town planning until 
uh, really from the mid uh, 19th century, I suppose, late 19th century, uh, through to even today, of course, the, 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 these are used in some particular context. This, in fact, is um, an associate of Frank Law Olmsted. Olmsted, of course, designed Central Park uh, and Delaware Park in Buffalo, basically, and had a big uh, landscape practice, basically. But one of his associates, Manning, first used this overlay analysis in 1912. Uh, there's a great paper by Carl Steinitz on hand-drawn overlay analysis in uh, the Landscape Journal uh, back in 1976. I'll refer to that in a moment. Uh, uh, there's a book in uh, just published after the war, basically, Town and Country Planning Textbook. Um, it's the Association of um, uh, for planning and regional reconstruction. You can see the, the title there, APPRR. Um, and uh, this was in 1950. And there's a very good chapter there by Jacqueline Tirowit, uh, who basically wrote about how you could use these overlay methods in this particular context to actually sieve out or filter out areas for development which were in some sense ideal. Uh, and a somewhat clearer example is to me in Macard's 1969 book, Design with Nature, where he uses overlay analysis to filter out and sieve out, we should say, sieve mapping or filter mapping in this sense, overlay mapping, the most desirable location. And there's a picture of Ian Macard. He was a professor of landscape at Penn uh, and his, uh, his famous book, basically, in 1969. And these are the typical factors, physical factors, but also socioeconomic factors such as accessibility, which are put together in overlay fashion very simply uh, to actually fi filter out the most appropriate locations for development. Now, I can't remember um, the detail of this, whether the black or the dark is uh, is, is is against development or, or for development, basically. It doesn't matter, basically, in a sense, but these are the sorts of issues that uh, really dominated that kind of thinking and still do uh, to some extent, etc. Uh, now, there are several versions of GIS that build on overlay analysis that if you look at any of the standard GIS, particularly ESRI, ARC, uh, Arc Info or, um, or QGIS, which is the uh, uh, which is the open source one, um, uh, you can actually see the development of this layer model, this overlay model, is pretty central to the idea of the way different data layers are captured in GIS. Uh, and in the last two decades, Carl Steinitz, who uh, used to be at Harvard, but uh, and is uh, uh, still works basically and work, is related to our particular group here at CASA, uh, lives in London. He has uh, promulgated this idea of geo design, geography. Uh, on design, which really goes back through uh, the history of these ideas. Um, and you can see the paper I referred to earlier on, hand-drawn overlays, the history and perspective uses. That's a good paper to look at the traditions in those areas in landscape architecture in, in 1976. Here's a picture of Carl uh, with, in fact, a group of people from the Centre for Livable Cities in Singapore. Uh, that's in, uh, in CASA. That was when they came to uh, for us to talk to them about uh, various tools and techniques, etc. And you can see, I think there were a number of pictures yesterday uh, in some of the ones that are, some of the presentations I saw, which was showing similar kinds of workshop activity uh, where the participants were uh, developing different uh, uh, schemes and plans and so on uh, in this kind of group context, a sort of crowdsourcing type or hackathon type, a whole variety of techniques I know were introduced yesterday uh, for this kind of participation. Uh, and to some extent, um, uh, some of the overlay analyses that I've just indicated really relate to uh, what Carl talks about in terms of geo design. Um, his book, um, A Framework for Geo Design, is published by ESRI Press, basically, uh, and the subtitle, of course, uh, the strap line is uh, Changing Geography by Design in that sense. OK, so let me say a little bit about design methods, because to some extent, all of these things can be thought of uh, as design methods in some sense. These emerged uh, as part of the systems approaches uh, to urban planning in the 1960s um, and are based on the idea of identifying, as we've already seen, uh, a series of inputs, if you like, or, or features or factors, variables which we can represent in terms of, say, land suitability, 
uh, or land utility in that sense, utility or suitability for development, basically. Uh, and in essence, um, the design problem is to resolve the conflicts between them. If there are no conflicts between the factors or features, basically, and then there's no problem in this sense. But uh, so the Im implication is that in this kind of thinking, there are a whole series of factors and features that need to be resolved. The conflict between them needs to be resolved. And of course, um, the factors and features may have different, uh, they have different uh, surfaces of desirability or suitability, but they also have different weights. And to some extent, the design problem is to associate the different weights with um, uh, various criteria which pertain to how one might uh, resolve the, the conflicts between them. Now, schematically, uh, this amounts to the following. This is a very simple uh, idea of taking a bunch of maps and maps here, for example, uh, of suitability and resolving them in some sense. Uh, and this is simply showing you the kind of linear uh, thinking that is associated to some extent with overlay analysis that I've already shown. Now, that sort of overlay analysis, of course, uh, developed by the, the designers who use it, they don't think necessarily uh, in terms of these, uh, the, these, these linear models. But in essence, what they're doing is effectively choosing a series of weights um, uh, which uh, enable them to add up the or to sum up the, um, uh, the features, basically, in this particular context, uh, and to produce some kind of weighted average, basically, in that sense. So to some extent, all of the methods really relate to this idea of some sort of weighted average. What kind of weighted average is, is, is developed is really what uh, I'll be talking about in, in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Okay, so the simplest possible structure um, is to look at how the maps or the, degree, the, the the land suitability relates to one another in that sense. And there are obviously different degrees of correlation or similarity between them. We can group them in different ways. We can group them in hierarchical fashion. So here's an example where we've got uh, six um, different factors, doesn't matter what they are, but six things that conflict. Um, and if we look at the correlations between them, we can cluster them uh, in this particular way. Uh, and from that, you can derive uh, some kind of hierarchy of clustering in that sense. So uh, items one and two form a, a subcluster, et cetera, um, three, four, and five, another one, and so on. Uh, and as we aggregate, we move towards the, the total problem in that way. There are lots of realizations of this kind of structure. Um, uh, if, the, if the sets overlap in this particular context, then one can produce some sort of a lattice or semi-lattice type structure in this way. And it's no accident that some of these design methods were developed in the 1960s by uh, Christopher Alexander, who was the uh, doyen of uh, modern uh, architectural theory to some extent. Uh, Christopher Alexander in 1962, but it's implicit, this idea of breaking a problem into sub-problems, et cetera, and resolving the sub-problems one by one, ultimately until the overall problem is resolved according to these sorts of hierarchies. It's implicit in the in, in various thinking about problem solving uh, before Alexander, which he drew on. Uh, Polya, for example, in his How to Solve It book, um, has similar sorts of thinking. Uh, Herbert Simon, in his Architecture of Complexity book and his Sciences of the Artificial in 1969, basically uh, uh, developed the same kind of thing. There are several groups of people uh, who developed these things in the 1960s. Okay, interactions in design. So if we've got a bunch of factors like this and we want to hierarchically cluster them to produce, if you like, uh, this hierarchy, the hierarchy would show us uh, how closely related the different subproblems. Now, subproblem in this context represents the. Um, I hope we haven't got that. Basically, it's my VPN come up on it. Um, okay, so um, I, uh, the, the 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 problems basically the clusters basically uh, relate re the, the factors I should say uh, relate to the subproblems. Well, I'll, I'll I'll give you an example of this in a moment to to fix ideas in that sense. Where are we? Whoops. Okay, that's better. Okay, now that's fairly typical of the design methods that came out of the 1960s, particularly the Alexander uh, Mannheim method. And you can see the six different uh, factors uh, and um, a simple graph uh, relating them uh, one to another. Um, all of the noise is ironed out in this. The current, they're, they're not strict 
strictly speaking, correlations. Basically, uh, design methods theorists, uh, the design theorists argued that uh, these these linkages should be looked at intuitively in some sense rather than numerically or systematically, although there are variants of this. And you can see the order uh, in which these factors might be considered. So in other words, if, if factors one and two, uh, two different uh, land suitability services um, are integrated in some way, uh, weighted in some sense to produce a, a composite, then the composite is then taken forward according to the uh, the design tree, the hierarchical tree in this particular fashion. Uh, okay, so, uh, so so that's relatively straightforward. The, the design tree shows the averaging process basically. Uh, and here we've got an example that uh, I'll show you very quickly. Um, if we if we ascribe weight to each of these uh, six factors, basically in that particular context, then we can add up, uh, produce weighted averages at each stage in the tree, basically. Um, and uh, you can see that the ultimate weighted average, uh, uh, the ultimate uh, average map, if you like, or uh, where we're all been taken into account in that sense. Uh, is produced in that particular manner. Uh, if we if we go down the tree the other way, then we can see um, uh, the, how the weights uh, pan out in this particular context. Uh, and you can see that each of the factors has a differential weight once we get to the bottom of the tree. And that really reflects the structure. Uh, and of course, as we get different structures, we get different sort of uh, weighted averages in this particular context. And that's really the essence of um, uh, the essence of these methods. Now, um, uh, in some senses, one does not need really to look at the design tree in this sense. It's quite possible to think about weighted averages uh, using the network itself that in that sense. So let's take a a simple network of, uh, in this case, four different factors, okay? You can think of these as four different maps, all co conflicting with one another in a sense. And we can illustrate this as a process of averaging or uh, what is sometimes called um, in the literature opinion pool pooling, so that we can actually produce uh, an appropriate weighted average. We can do this uh, in a series of stages. So let me actually uh, digress slightly into this problem and show you how it works in terms of uh, 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 opinion pooling and network. There's our little network. We can assume that uh, each one of those uh, nodes basically is either a feature or a factor. It might be a land development map or land suitability map, or it could be a stakeholder. It could be an actor. It could be a social network where uh, the actors are designers and they each have different views about the problem, basically. Um, and the essence is to resolve conflict between them in that sense. So if we think of that as an actor and we think of that as a digraph in that sense, uh, a directed graph, then the arrows um, indicate how a particular actor can swap his or her message, his, uh, his, his or her view of the problem in terms of land suitability with those actors to whom uh, they are immediately related in that sense. So you can see that um, uh, actor three, for example, uh, on the bottom right-hand corner um, is linked to one, uh, two, and four, and also to him or herself in that particular context. Uh, so let, so this is our communications network where we can swap ideas. We can, we can pool our opinions. So let's see how it works in that sense. We'll give each actor in the network an opinion. We give it a number. And we can operate the network by asking them to communicate this number to their nearest neighbours and then form a compromise, which is an, an, an average, a weighted average. Uh, when I presented this sort of stuff in the past, basically, people always uh, stand up and shout at this particular point and say, of course, you know, uh, people won't compromise, etc. Uh, indeed, um, that is absolutely right. The whole purpose of this is to begin to think about the network of relationships between all of these things that relate to the problem. We're not talking in real terms about just four actors here. We're probably talking about four. Five, five more minutes. Yeah, OK. Five that's that's OK. Q &A. Thanks very much, Hannah. Um, OK, so the weighted average, I can rush through this fairly quickly. It's fairly obvious, basically. Um, this particular uh, picture we've got our, our numbers on. You can see if we if we swap those, then basically the average is going to be somewhere between, basically. So these determine the, uh, the limits, if you like, in that particular context. So if we take three uh, and we said it was related to one, two, 
and related to uh, four and itself, basically, then this gives us our weighted average, which is sort of midway between, to some extent, 10 and 90, which are the extremes, basically. Of course, if we had a really big network, uh, then um, uh, things would be uh, would be would be somewhat different. They would be much more realistic, basically. So here we've got this. I'm whipping it through. Oh, let me just show that table. That's actually what happens if we go through this averaging, and then ultimately, of course, all of the actors uh, have the same limit. Um, if everybody is related to everybody else, you get an immediate solution in that sense. Uh, if, for example, the, the network is disconnected, you get two solutions. In this particular context, because two never receives any input from any of the other uh, actors, or one, three, or four, uh, then there will be um, uh, the two will ultimately dominate. It will continue to pass the message associated with two to the rest. Uh, and uh, as they compromise and continue to compromise, then we'll get an average, basically. So I've actually rearranged this in terms of uh, the sequence uh, in that context. I've turned it around and showed ultimately how this works. You're beginning to see, I think, at this particular point, if you've not seen already, it's fairly obvious, I guess, uh, that uh, this is reminiscent of a neural net. Rather different in the sense that we're not we're not talking about trying to train um, uh, these factors through their weights on some ultimate real city. We're, we're trying to produce an ideal in that sense, and that really is the is the relationship that uh, we saw. Now, there's lots of things here that uh, these are all bits and pieces uh, of what we've talked about. Uh, there's the weighted average, basically. We're talking about a network and so on. Uh, we can also modify this by adding in exogenous uh, attitudes uh, in in a sense in some sense. Examples, locating new towns. Now, let me go over this pretty quickly. Um, here, for example, are a bunch of factors. Okay, this is a small town in uh, Macclesfield, uh, the town of Macclesfield in North uh, uh, in North Cheshire, uh, in the Manchester sort of suburbs, um, the Manchester hinterland, I should say. Uh, and there's the little town at the bottom, basically. Uh, those are our factors of desirability. This is simply a a demo, a little bit more of a demo. There's our, our, our weighting matrix. Uh, and you can actually see uh, what actually happens to the to the factors as we begin to go through this series of compromises. There are 12 in all, so it's a little bit more complex than our, our four factor. But I, I must um, emphasize that uh, we're really talking for this to come into its own about much bigger problems, basically, in that sense. Okay, you can see that the, uh, the, the ultimate location, basically, in that sense. Uh, Alexander and uh, Marvin Mannheim uh, looked at a problem in highway location, which is a little bit like the Ian MacHarg problem in design with nature, basically. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, papers that I've written over the years, um, going back uh, a number of years, basically, that, uh, that resolve that. But there is a bigger literature associated with people like uh, Blondell and uh, Hendricks and so on on opinion pooling and consensus and flocking and so on that relates to it. Okay, now uh, two minutes, uh, Hannah, sorry I'm over a little bit, but explaining the real city, generalization to neural nets and, and uh, deep learning. We can switch tack massively here and think about explaining um, the problem as a, a real city in some sense. So in other words, there's our, our, our example of the ideal that we're trying to that we move towards in terms of the, uh, the the markovian design machine basically and the real city basically so how close is the real to the ideal basically and to some extent we could think about the weights that we get um i've not done this but uh, the weights that we would get by by training it on the real um uh possibly would uh, would imply the ideal in some way in that context. Uh, so again, um, this is the the real on the right hand side rather than the ideal. Uh, and we present these different uh, factors, uh, one, one to another, uh, with respect to the uh, neural net, basically, uh, and all of the stuff that relates to, you know, how many layers and all this sort of thing we need, uh, uh, needs to be thought about in that sense. So uh, this is the, this show the real and the ideal, basically, in a sense. And of course, to do this, then we need to think about um, uh, how we represent these features and factors. The most important things in thinking about those sorts of models, I think, uh, these learning models, basically, or iterative models, is to actually get the features right. Everybody seems to say that. Okay, uh, so, um, so, 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 so basically, 
Uh, this is the kind of picture that uh, we're heading towards. So this is work in progress to some extent. Um, and um, really what we're doing is taking little bits of these maps, basically, and presenting them as uh, images to this. So where do we go from here? Um, well, we need to figure out what the weights are, but more importantly, we need to figure out what these weights are uh, if we go down the, uh, the 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 machine learning route. Basically, how close are they to the sort of weights we would get uh, in terms of the the clusters? Uh, we need to introduce a design process itself into the kind of architecture of the neural net. Basically, you know what it means in this sense. There's some big questions involved in that, uh, and we also need to work out a wide variety of problems where this sort of stuff is useful and where it's not useful. Basically, in that sense. So. At that point, I'm going to stop. Thanks for listening. Thank you to Ivan Schrossler and uh, Richard Milton, who helped me to understand uh, all of this sort of uh, new stuff, uh, basically. And uh, last but not least, I'll show you pictures of uh, our books in the New Science of Cities book in 2013. I do have a section on this. It's a section that <laughs> nobody ever reads, I think, um, on that. And then our Urban Informatics book last year is, uh, Springer is online, basically. Uh, so it's a kind of edited book, basically. Thank you very much. And I'll hand back to our host.